o'clock, uh, 2022. So, uh, approval of the agenda. Anybody got anything they want to add or no? Approval of the agenda recommendation that the planning development committee meeting agenda for February 23rd, 2022 be approved and circulated. Or um, all in favor? Yes. Adoption of minutes, approval of the minutes. Recommendation that the minutes of the planning and development committee meeting held on February 9th, 2022 be adopted. Brian Deb, all in favor, good. Oh. Development services update, Scott. <clears throat> Our current applications, I think we added one at the bottom and removed another one that was issued at the, the last council meeting. Um, that's a little bit, little bit slow right now, but. Uh, Comments. Go ahead, Brian. The Coach Road project has the. It's they're just dealing with the um, uh, the spia issues with that wall. It, that's still that's still an ongoing thing. Exactly. They need to. Uh, they need to have their their permit essentially approved by the province, and, and that's what's taking the time because they already built it. Yeah, it takes longer to get approval. For sure, for sure it does. Yeah, yeah I just, just keep keep seeing that. What's going on with that? Any comments on the completed applications? Okay, uh, new business. Revitalization tax exemption, RTE presentation. This was on the last one we didn't get to it. So is uh so Kelly Kelly's on her way and I think she has it set up on the on the computer already, Steffi. Yeah. So maybe if you just bring up, I think it's on the like the browser. Get out of the It's the second. Am I on already? Um, betcha. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been some issues. Some issues? Yeah. Just take your mask off so we can hear you. That's the chair. Hey, thank so you. John is not able to hear what we are speaking. <coughs> okay, our volume isn't working. Uh, yeah, volume is high. Okay, so we are going to have a brief uh, um, discussion about tax exemption. So we have a uh, both uh, Councillor Malmes and Councillor Bushell have already um, had this presentation. I'll, I'll try to make it brief. It's it's a presentation that was brought to Council in November and Council directed uh, me to seek input from the Planning and Development Committee as well as the DOSDC board uh, in terms of tax exemptions and kind of what we want to attract in Sycamix. So with that, I will start. So tax exemptions, what are they? Um, hold on. Uh, sorry, this is clearly, um, here we go. So about, now we're starting. So definition, it's a tool for council to encourage development to achieve a range of economic and social objectives within the community. How to provide municipal tax relief on new construction and upgrades in a specific area or a specific type of development over a defined length of time. So it can be the maximum amount is uh, 10 years. Typically they're five to 10 years. Um, th there's rules for applying a tax exemption. Yeah, okay. Uh, they must tie to the OCP and zoning bylaws. You can't just apply a tax exemption to an, uh, an, an area that isn't within the zoning or OCP. It must, uh, the, the, OC the 
bylaw must define the a reason and an area and requires direction from council in terms of the area and the extent of the tax relief. Um, the, really the question is, is what development does Sycamus want to encourage and where do they want to encourage it? So that's the whole point of the tax exemption. So back um, in 2016, we went through this, uh, we created a bylaw, bylaw 918. Uh, the objectives of that bylaw was to generate economic growth, new investment, and community revitalization as prioritized in the OCP. The details of the exemption that our current bylaw is, there's four areas, um, as you can see in this map. Um, the first one is the hotel development. That is the most aggressive tax exemption that we have. It's the maximum we are able to, which is 10 years of no municipal tax. Um, and that's for anywhere within the municipal. We're really building a um, hotel for $5 million, which I'm sure it'll cost more nowadays. But if you are, uh, you would save about $44,000 a year in taxes or $468,000 over a 10 year term. So far, no applications have been made or tax exemption issued for this incentive. The next one uh, is town center. It's the second most aggressive tax exemption. We have two, one for improvements of 25,000 and one for improvements over 100,000. Um, the 25,000 or over is uh, five years, 100,000 or over is 10 years, but it's five years full tax relief, five year graduated tax relief, which means 80%. 60%, 40%, 20%. Uh, so if you were to develop something in the town center as defined in this green area um, for about 500,000, you would save $4,400 a year or approximately 34,000 over the period. Uh, so far we have five applications made for this. Um, four of them are the 10 year and one of them is for the five year. The industrial development area has the exact same, um, which is defined in this blue, blue area, has the exact same relief, which is uh, 10 years, five years full and five years graduated. If you were to construct a, a $500,000 building, uh, you would save $6,400 year one and just over 50,000 over the term. So far, we have one application made and tax exemption issued. Actually, since preparing this, we have one more application. So we'll, we'll make that two. And the last one on the list is highway commercial, which is this yellow area. Um, and this is the least aggressive tax incentive we have. It's for anything over 100,000, but it's five, five years graduated. So year one, um, if you were building something for 500,000, you would save $4,400 in taxes and over the five years, you'd save about 11. And to date, we've had one application made. So that's what we currently have. Um, so in summary, we have four areas that have been established. There's been, it's just over five years since the program was established. We've had seven tax exemption issued. So now it's time to review and make changes. To what we currently have. So that what is what is bringing me here to you today. Um, so really, where do we want to go in the future? So once again, it all ties to OCP. And one thing that we're not doing is, in our tax incentive bylaw is encouraging and supporting attainable housing. And as you know, housing is an issue here. Um, so one thing that we can do through a tax incentive is to encourage purpose-built rentals. So this is a, is a non-stratified unit uh, or a, a building that would house five or more dwelling units intended to be used for rental housing, not necessarily affordable housing or, or it's rental housing. So purpose-built rental. Mm. And it meets an identified need for housing within the Sycamus and does not include buildings that are stratified. Okay. So uh, details, the developer of a purpose-built rental, there could, would be a 10-year agreement with the district of Sycamus that that would um, remain rental, or you could put a covenant on title, either or. 
And really, uh, we have a multifamily development permit area, which is within the entire district of Sycamus boundaries, as long as it's uh, appropriately zoned um, for multifamily development. And so really the question would be, are we interested and how much tax relief and where do we want it? Uh, in addition, we could provide a tax exemption to commercial buildings to convert or add upper floors as rental units. That could be another way we can incentivize this. And right now in the town center development area, so that's the red area, uh, it supports commercial residential mixed use. So we can, pr we can provide not for this whole area, but as, uh, maybe in the red area, we could provide something there to encourage uh, additional um, mixed use re uh, residential up there. Um, and really the question is, what else? Is there any other changes? Um, we have our existing tax exemption uh, spots here in color. And then we have our OCP land use here. Um, so there are some change, changes we could make. Like for example, this town center right now is a pretty green area and it kind of straddles the highway here. We could um, make the town center a little smaller and really focus on the town center. Um, we could add something if we want to encourage development at Old Town, if we wanted to encourage it um, down on Wiseman Creek, we really have the flexibility, but we have to be mindful that, hold on, that, um, oh, high five, next steps, that there's a cost. Like does the tax exemption actually stimulate development or would it happen regardless? So if you take all the tax exemptions we have issued to date, uh, for 2021, we've lost $37,000 of tax revenue. So that's almost a 1% tax increase. Um, and would this development occur regardless? And this is where we want to be strategic with our tax incentive and not blanket the community with everything. Because if it's going to happen anyways, we're missing out. On, on badly needed tax revenue. So we really wanna be strategic in terms of what do we want? What do we wanna encourage and where do we wanna encourage it? Um, so really today um, I'm, I'm to gather feedback from the board as well as the committee. I'm, I'm compiling information. And then because we already have a bylaw to amend the bylaw isn't very difficult. It's more about gathering the information and making sure we're defining the areas the way we want, want them to. Um, really, uh, the bylaw amendment would require a little bit of public notice and three or four months um, to finalize. And that's pretty much it. I do have a handout uh, that I will give to you so you can fill out that has just a one pager that has you know, questions in terms of what your thoughts are. It also has a map of the current tax exemption areas and a map of the land use areas. And if you wanted to mark it up, put whatever comments you want on it, that's what we want. We want feedback. Um, anything, sir? Oh. So some time ago, we had a discussion kind of about tax exemption. And yeah, the question is, is, is it actually doing what we want it to do? Okay, we've offered a tax exemption to the entire community to a hotel. And we we really like to see a hotel. So I agree with that. The rest of it, the development downtown and, the, and all of it is, is I think gonna go ahead without this revitalization tax. But when we first started having planning development meetings a couple of years ago, when Greg Darrell attended all of them. Uh, basically, the biggest thing that was asked for by developers or builders was to move the DCC from an upfront cost to a back end cost. And Mr. Parliament suggested that there is a way to do that. Uh, you, you can defer them to different stages of the project and then collect them so that the developer is not paying finance costs on, on money that he hasn't turned into profit or or anything yet. So, and I, I honestly believe personally that 
that would be of a better benefit than a revitalization tax because you're, you're borrowing money to pay finance charges on that you don't get a return on or you don't get your actual mortgage till you get a builder's construction loan. So I, I don't know, that's just my personal thought is, Brian? Yeah, I, I totally agree. The upfront costs are, <clears throat> are definitely the problem. Um, the, um, that, that's where the issue is. I think, I think the purpose-built rental, um, I think that is such an important thing that, that we need to target. So I would say that that would be one, you know, this, this makes a lot of sense, but for somebody to come in and <clears throat> say, build a, a mixed use building on Main Street here and put, uh, put some um, residential above it to, to take on that. I don't think they're gonna look, I don't think they're gonna say, well, I went to Sycamus because they had a tax exemption. I, I just don't, I don't think, and, and we're leaving a little on the table because the market right now is is, is so strong. So I kind of you know what you were alluding to before about um, they were they were going to come anyway, um, and we you know it's a better market than it was a few years ago. You know we can be a little bullish, um, but I think that I think that purpose built rental um, is something that whatever we can do to try and. Um, to try and stimulate that. That's, that's what's really needed. And it's hard for a developer, especially, you know, because they're not big, big guys. They're, you know, they're, they're little guys that need the, need the upfront cost help. And there's other things too, is if you, um, if the district of sickness was to help with, um, uh, you know, sewer water and sewer hookups and there's things, other municipalities, municipalities have helped out they've waived certain fees to try and stimulate things like that but yeah it's uh anyway that's that's my long-winded answer so what i'm hearing is tax incentives are not necessarily that important it's it's the upfront cost so there is potential appetite to reduce the tax incentives that we currently have yeah uh, and I'll give you guys a little handout so you can mark up on. And with the DCC comment, I mean, currently right now, you can pay your DCCs over a, a three-year period, a third, a third, and a third. The only thing with that is you do have to provide a letter of credit for the full amount. So you still have to have that resource and that money secure somewhere, yeah. but you can pay it over phases that, that currently exists. Yeah, but you only pay out what you've actually taken out, so... You don't pay a lump sum that you haven't got. As you draw it, that's what yeah. you incur the cost. So, go ahead, Terry. Yeah, thanks to the chair. So, one of the main reasons we started this was uh, so that we could compete with the neighboring communities because uh, you have Salmon Arm and Vernon and so forth. Uh, they they have these programs in place. I do think that we really have to digest this again uh, for. And, um, and and make some changes to it. I do agree. I don't think that tax exemptions are totally in our best interest um, because if we want to grow the community, we need that tax revenue. So um, how we how we look at this, got to take in consideration that we are still competing with the neighborhood communities. It's beneficial to the community. And, um, and how we change this so that it's still in our best interest. I still think we need this policy, but I'm not so sure that I agree with everything that's in it at this stage. More targeted. Mm -hmm. Board? Yeah, through the chair. <clears throat> yeah, I always remembered uh, when you DCCs come up for, for payment, you know, uh, we always ask for them at that time when we did a development, it was in advance. And it was, it's always hard to, you know, put that money aside. And uh, and the thing is that the, the district normally doesn't use the DCC money right away anyways. So when you can defer them for a third, a third, a third, or even better defer, defer them on, on, on for possession, um, you know, the possession date happens and the DCCs 
district. That really helps. But the other thing we I remember when we did the first round of this with uh, Kelly and I think Todd and myself, I can't remember who else was in it. We, uh, you know, we want jobs, you know, that's why we have the hotel. We wanted some jobs industry, but you know, if there was a, if some industry wanted to come to town and, we, and had a whole bunch of employees and you needed a whole bunch of employees, that's where we wanted to do it in the industrial park. So it, it hasn't really fared out what we wanted, but yeah, I still think there is, should be some tax incentive to be able to compete. Uh, I mentioned the council today, we had uh, a hotel call me this morning and uh, they are, they're looking at a big piece of property in town. And, and the first thing she asked was what's the, you know, I know you guys have DCC incentives or incentives and what else do you have? And she mentioned DCCs. So yeah, so they're out there looking right now and uh, something we should look, should, should be refining for sure. And I will say that our DCs are extremely low. Like I would like to revise them and increase them <laughs> <laughs> because there's future infrastructure that needs to be paid for, right? So it's kind of like that happy medium of, oops, sorry, um, you know, so, so they are like our DCCs are relatively attractive in terms of the cost per square foot for commercial right now for like a hotel. I would say just the rate themselves is an incentive. Yeah, and, and one of the things we did miss is the uh, purpose built, you know, uh, rental rentals. We missed that uh, on the first round and it should be for sure included. I think you hit it right on the head. Yep. Yeah, no, I agree with everything being said because it, you know, like there was a time where I think we had to spend money on some things because things didn't look great. No, you know, like it wasn't someplace you wanted to invest your money. And I think Brian's right. Some of this is just happening anyway, because it is looking better. People are seeing the opportunity and it's coming out of that, but you know, it needs to be targeted deferred, you know, as somebody that had to develop something and spend a lot of upfront money before you got cash flow, it hurts, you know, it, it's, it's tough for a while. So agreed. And, you know, I know we are reviewing our subdivision and servicing bylaw, which is another massive thing is the offsite servicing required by developers. So, so hopefully um, those standards are making it easier and less offsite works as well. Yeah, I think the big companies that would be um, building a hotel, I really think that they're not, they're not worried about as much. It's, it's like, it's, it's like, right? It's, Market. you know, they, they, you know, it's either going to work or it's not, and they're, they're going to come in anyway. And I, I think it's a matter of time before, like, this is the way the market has been. And the land cost is, is very inexpensive and sick of this compared to, you know, not very far away. <laughs> that Terry. <laughs> Give them the opportunity to share a meeting and see results. Eh? <laughs> I just want to know, Kelly, um, and uh, with the, the committee here right now, what do you feel are next steps and what do you require when it comes to seeing some changes and and uh, what is that you're going to suggest and where are we going for, you know, where are we going with this now? I mean, what needs to be done? What's next steps? Uh, great question. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys all handouts to fill out. Uh, I've given um, some to council and to the DOSDC board. I will compile the information and then I'll bring it back to council. At some point, maybe we do a workshop and we have some maps up and we have a discussion. Okay. Right now, I'm just trying to gather input from different sources. Uh, so I, I agree with the, if we could do something with the DCCs, I, at this point, I don't think it would be, I mean, we can look at what the other communities are doing for costs for DCCs. We work to get to be to the bottom the race to get there and then you come with the revitalization taxes and in five years it hasn't done that much i agree with the like the housing project rental but we could also waive the connection fee that's a great idea because you know i, I don't know what it is for for if you're doing a, a 20 unit townhouse what the connection fee is going to be uh, single residence is $4,500. So, you know, 
the area where we want it, we need to pick that out. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that we should be giving away tax dollars. Honestly, it's we 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 have enough property that we're doing stuff with that is created tax free environments that we're not getting any revenue from. So, with our own programs that we're doing, uh, we have to leave some room for private industry. It becomes the only business in town that's doing assisted or affordable renting, then why are you going to incur it? Why, why would a developer come here to do any of that? So we have to be cognizant of how much that we do. We shouldn't be in the competition building. Anything else on this? And just to follow up, so I'm hearing, you know, minimize the tax in incentive areas. Uh, definitely add something for purpose-built rentals. Look at other methods via DCCs, waiving fees, some kind of other incentive package for specifically for housing. Or well, for, at first, like, right, this is where we're getting, like, we're waiving fees. What is it for? I have a question. If, so if you put it, you say, okay, this area, we're looking to, uh, for purpose-built rental in this area in this big blanket area and then so you don't really get to decide who's going to come in and do it like because there's there's a there's a developer and then there's a developer right it's so is there a way of having that uh, that say the developer come in and say okay this is my plan and then the council would have the opportunity to say okay well this is what we can do for you or is that not in the rules so they have, do you have to have a blanket thing for anybody? Do, do you know what I'm saying? I do. And the reality is, is we under the charter cannot assist. Did I get pulled up? So this is where we have to be, be very mindful of what we're defining in terms of what, that's why it has to things have to tie to OCPs and zoning bylaws and policies because it has to fit yeah. in with what we're trying to encourage. Because so can we cherry pick? No. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else on the RT? I'm going to bring handouts back down for everybody. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. I'll be right back. Okay. Sure. Development variance permit 22 023 VP 1125 Willow Road. Okay, so this is uh, an application for a uh, development variance permit. We just received it, so the application isn't quite complete, but we want to bring it to, to council or um, go to the committee and to council as soon as possible. Um, Green Emerald Developments, Mayor Snow, Gary might be on the line. Um, if, if he is, maybe he can raise his hand or shout out, but uh, it's in the Parksville uh, subdivision, so the committee, uh, we had a discussion on this subdivision at the last Planning Development Committee. This is one that is, um, yeah, it's not owned by the, the owner, the, the developer of the, the property. This is a lot that's been sold separately. Um, so this isn't one that is necessarily being considered other ones. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know, designated low density residential and it's owned the R1, the urban residential zone, which is unique to this property. Um, I just got the next slide is a, a drawing that uh, I just got this yesterday. <clears throat> so the rear setback is supposed to be six meters. The front setback is supposed to be four meters. Um, so they had their footings inspected or they were okay to pour their footings. And the um, building inspector asked for a survey to show that the footings are where they're supposed to be. They weren't, I guess. The <laughs> The guy pouring it just kind of lined it up with the other houses, right? That's what you do. You eyeball it and pour it and good to go. Well, no. So he, so this is when I went out on Friday and they've already put up the walls. <laughs> uh, back up a bit. Um, the other direction. And even just looking at this now, you know, if it's supposed to be six meters on the back and they're at 4.9, if you did move it to meet the six meters, they wouldn't have the four meters in the front. So I don't know how they thought they were gonna fit this house on the lot to begin with. 
Um, yeah, and they did proceed. I think they may have even poured the the, the walls this week. Um, so yeah, they have got one inspection for the footing that turned up that it wasn't the right spot and they've continued with the construction. So they've put in an application to, to vary it. Um, you know, if it, the other ones, they are right. The other ones did get a variance for the, for the back, but uh, that's where we are today. Um, yeah, like I said, I think I just got this drawing yesterday. So kind of not ready to create the permit, but bring to this committee for any advice or direction, advice for the, uh, the builder or direction for staff. And Gary, are, are you on the line? There's Gary. He's muted. Well, I'd just like to make a comment while we're waiting for him to figure out how to unmute himself. Um, I thought that when we did this at our last planning development meeting that we were blanketing that entire park scheme whether the lots were sold or otherwise to find that was my, I thought that was what our intention was. Is that not correct? That's correct. So we're, we're still waiting for the application to come in, for kind of the blanket application. This is kind of more of a, a one-off. Um, he wants to, to keep going. So yeah, we're, we're essentially gonna have probably two, if not three different processes happening as people want to, build these units? Well, I, personally, I don't, there's a big difference between six meters and 4.9. I'm just going like, and, and you're continuing construction like you're gonna get your variance. So that's a lot of assumption on somebody's part. Not enough in the front either. Any other comments? I've got a question. Go ahead. So the, um, the other variances are for to to vary the the uh, the backyard setback from six to five. Correct. And that's something that the council um, has an appetite for. So so then this one would probably be varied from six to five anyway. Um, it, it's kind of too bad that it's under five. Um, that's a unfortunate but um yeah it's kind of the, it's kind of the same thing anyway you know like if you're gonna if you're gonna vary them all to five then but you know i don't know that was, that, that was my question though is is that if that was going to go through the whole the whole subdivision then yeah right and so if i guess ram and his his company was going to go through with it, then chances are these, these would be caught up in it as well. They just haven't made a move yet. And, uh, and yeah, we're, and obviously Gary's looking to, to move forward quickly because he's construction. So is that process then that they have to make the application or can we not just do it? We could just do it, um, but we are waiting because they, they have some, corner lots that they might not, that they might have to apply for variances. Like I was kind of waiting for them to say, okay, this is what we want to move forward with before I, I move forward with it, right? But we were kind of very clear at that meeting that we were going to give them the six to five and nothing else. Right. Don't come back with any, you make it fit on what you have. Right. And their design guy said that he could. So, because they wanted to crowd out that corner lot right to the corner, basically. And we said no because of sight lines. They're, they're, those are there for a reason. So, like I said, I thought we were very, very, very clear. I I think you were. I'm still waiting for them to show me what what they would like to see. Okay, go ahead, Brian. What's the side yard setback? One and a half. What was it in there? Right. Okay. I was looking at it. Any other comments? So are you looking for a yeeha or a planning department? It's up to you. We'll, we will bring it back once we have the complete application and you can make a recommendation to council. Maybe at that time we'll have more information. So we don't have 
the complete application on this property yet? Well, I haven't written the permit yet. I just got this drawing yesterday, so okay. I haven't had time to. Well, like I said, I thought we were going five meters on the entire, that, that whole development, whether the lots were sold or not. So that was kind of what our discussion was. So right. if we're going to do 68 lots of them, we might as well do the other four that are sitting there. Yeah. As have them have a different rule. It appears if the that picture, if they lined it up with the house next door, he's already inside that he got his permit. And I don't remember them coming for a variance. So because so, I think the planning and development committee went over there and looked at the backyards of those places. Uh, I'm just going to say the like the blanket authorization is still for five, five meters. This is under that. So under the meeting, okay. to make some comments. We still are going to have to do a special thing for him, aren't we? Yeah, point one and point oh eight. Yeah. Okay, so you're not asking for a recommendation. Not, not this time. Uh, I think Gary. Is able he did was able to phone in. He, I think he's stuck on mute. I don't know if he has something he wants to say. Gary, do you have a way to unmute yourself? So he's unmuted. He's not muted. Um, Is there an option for Gary to chat, like right? Oh, hello? Uh, should be through that option. No, I think we took the chat function off. Okay. We had him for a minute. That sounded like it. Well, as I said earlier, we were doing a blanket thing to five meters, and personally, he's at 4.9, which, you know what, he's, and then he continued on, and he hasn't got a permit yet. So I think that he's uh, pushing the envelope. So I would leave this one to uh, staff's discretion. Yeah. I'd almost be saying tear the wall down. Pardon me? I'd almost be saying tear the wall down. Gary said it's actually five meters at the front and the back to the foundation, not four point whichever was okay. discussed. Four point nine. So it will be five okay, meters so from the, the front and back foundation. To the or, foundation. Oh, sorry. Yes. Foundation. Okay. So this is the footing. So you'll be able to yeah. get 10 centimeters, I guess, with the foundation. Okay. As long as he's on the five meters, because we sort of discussed that whole development being there. So, yeah. All right. All right. So we'll leave it with staff that one. Uh, next on the agenda. Sycamus Park Estates, Mr. Greg Darrow, uh, does the staff have any comments to start with? No, well, we have one drawing that we can move on to. Um, so just with this, um, so this is a, a mobile home park where people um, like lease the, lease the pads and then they place their own units. Um, and then every time we get an application for a building permit, then, um, uh, we asked Mr. Darrow to prepare this drawing, um, and they they put in the line the the property lines, set back to the property lines for each unit, um, just so we know where each unit is in relation to the next one, and the the next purchaser can look and see where that unit is. They can locate their property their unit on the property. Um, part of six meters between each unit, they're allowed one accessory building. Um, per lot or per space. And then um, uh, 
I guess one one question is, you know, let's build a carport. Is that a necessary building or not? Um, and would the same setbacks come from the um, with these units? So they're coming from the factory. They have a stamp on them, a CSA stamp. They say they meet the Z two forty code. And you actually, you know, it's my understanding, it's my interpretation that as soon as you put a carport on it, the, the carport actually can't be supported by the unit. So that means to me that it's an accessory structure, not in addition to that primary structure. Um, Greg and I, Greg Darrow's here, Greg and I have, have had lots of discussions about this. We're trying to work out what the rules, final rules are. We can just, so everybody coming into the development knows exactly what the rules are. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Greg. And, uh, uh, Tell his side of the story. Uh, before you start, <laughs> before you start, Greg, could I ask uh, two questions? You can fire away, Jeff, at your meeting. <laughs> um, I notice when I look at these layouts that some of these structures are seven meters, and some of them are four point three four meters from the property line. What is the actual setback on the back of these? So, in a mobile home setting, uh, in a general, you know, I've done tens of millions of developments. <clears throat> They're imaginary property lines. There is no property lines. It's one title, right? So you have your boundary setbacks that you've done the variance on, all of that kind of stuff. So it's a moving target. It's just an imaginary line. It's not a very line. So fire code here, 1993, is six meters between homes. I, that's okay. I get that. So you can have a home two meters off this property, supposed boundary, as long as the next one is over six meters, right? Like, so it, it's a moving All right, What Scott's asking for is completely okay where the home's going. Nothing wrong with it. He gets it. They need to prove that you know they got separation. That's a fire thing. I get it. I don't have a problem. The, the issue is what is accessory buildings? That's the issue. <clears throat> Part of your bylaw says carport sheds are exempt, but it's unclear. It's unclear. You could read it the way Scott reads it. And we'll go to that. Mark Lambert, my co consultant, he reads it totally different. City of Vernon reads it different. City of Kona reads it different. And I know. And second is different. Carports can be freestanding, just use four posts. Right? They manufacture it. You don't have to attach them to the post. Are they accessory to the home? Council has to make a definition. I've, I've lost eight deals. The dealers don't want to support Sycamus at all because it's it's all over the map. So, so if you have one accessory building and the guy puts a shed in, now put a carport in. I'll, I'll just ask another question. Are all these units going to be new or are they going to be a mix? Can a guy bring a 20 year old trailer in there or uh, have in your bylaws? Jeff, you asked a good question. I'll give you an honest answer because I've known you for a long time. If I can't resolve this with the dealers, I have dealers all across British Columbia said that they'll move 20 year old homes here just to get rid of them and give them to me. Because they got buyers in West Kelowna, they got everything. They, there's no place to put a home. Uh, the, new, the new homes, the dealers will not support that. They're getting too many clients that want to move to sick moose, that want a carport and a shed. Can I speak to that? Uh, um, just a moment, please. Any comments from here? No, I, I'd like to hear everybody out. Okay. <clears throat> I've never met Greg before, but we're moving into this park. My name is Eileen Chipner, and we're going to be moving into Walk Water. <coughs> we're moving in a brand new home 
and it's not cheap. We were told by a countryside what we were allowed to have, and they even gave us an example of um, it's called Coyote Crossing with same kind of homes, countryside homes there. So he said, um, these are kind of the same rules because of BC, we're from Alberta. So um, I can't believe that there's been no rules set down, you know, where you can't find anything, get anything ever definite. We were told we could have a carport and a shed as well. Because my husband is handy, he's a plumber, a tradesman, he's not crippled. Good, he can work, he can have a life here, and he can do stuff. I'm a retired nurse, I'm still healthy. I can do stuff too, but I mean, we're having so much stress trying to get something finalized here because we want to have a car park. Okay. And, uh, I don't know, I can understand now Craig's frustration, but we were told we'd be all brand new homes, otherwise, we would never come to that park. Yeah. Now I'm told I can put a 20 year old beside it, you know, so liquid or fluid or whatever you want to call it. I just don't understand this. I don't mean to get anyone upset, but I'm upset. Because before you sell anything, anything out there, if you're going to do more parks like this, like have everything in place so when people come, they understand what they're getting and it's right there. Or even the developer has it so we can give it to you. I'm so high, actually. I'm going to go out the last one. Okay. I understand. So I, I have a couple of calls then. So I just wanted to consider we were told we could have variances and all this stuff like Blake, sorry to say that he passed away, that was our salesman, Blake Fitzberry, and um, he just passed away a couple of weeks ago. So now we feel like we're just totally in the dark, no one's speaking to us in our defense. Okay, so. Um... Scott or Sarah, in our new yet adopted zoning bylaws, they adopt. Big Sarah's looking that up right now. <laughs> I brought mine with me today. Let me look. <clears throat> If you maybe if we want to talk about lot five, um, so there they you know there there has to be six meters separation between units. Um, so you can see the the unit is you know the this drawing shows it you know at the the lower side of the lot five. So they they could put a carport on, have that separation between six meters between the carport and the next unit. And then, you know, the interpretation is it would be a, a accessory structure. So they're only allowed one accessory structure. So that's right, they could have the carport, but they couldn't have a shed. So it, it is it is tight, it is a tight spot to, to put everything you want on it, but I mean, that's the, the nature of it. And the the big driving factor is 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 fire safety. Um, you know, I think you've seen the, the response from the, the fire chief on whenever we get a, a variance to vary the, the side setbacks. And, you know, he, he has concerns about getting his people and his equipment between those, those units. It's, it's a real concern. There are ways in the building code you can, you know, you know have fire resistant materials and face things and, and deal with those separations. There is opportunities for variances to vary the, the bylaw, um, but yeah, I think I think it's a good point. Greg and I need to come up with a set of rules that everybody can can live with. Well, and, and unfortunately, because we've been five years making up a zoning bylaw, Sarah, what does it say? Um, so it doesn't limit the number of accessory buildings. It does limit the floor area, though. 
So trying to be a little more open about the number, but trying to put some kind of limit to try to retain like open space as well as, you know, for firefighting. So it says that you can have garages or carport. So the previous bylaw doesn't allow you to have a garage. It's a carport you can have, right? Um, sun or rain shelters, porches, rooms, and storage sheds. So it's, it's fairly broad. Um, and then it goes on to say, so if you have a single wide mobile home, the floor area of all those accessory units combined can't be more than 50% of a single wide. If it's a double wide, 20% is a bit less because the, the double wide takes up more of the parcel. So that's, that's what that says. And then, and then there's still setbacks, of course. Um, what are they? But I think it's, it's only from the exteriors and your internal roadways. So accessory buildings will be 1.5 meters from the rear. So that's only going to apply to the lots on the outside, right, of the development. And then the rest of the setbacks really apply to the mobile home itself. So I think you have to be eight meters back from your access road, internal access road, which is pretty standard. Generally, you don't want that in your front yard anyway. Um, so five have, meters. Have you seen the zoning bylaw for our? Uh, oh, but what Scott's saying about a carport. So the, the way Scott's treating it is, let's add a carport. Over the he wants six meters now from the edge of that carport to the next mobile. It's six meter separation on mobiles, not accessory buildings. That's the code everywhere else, every other municipality except Sycamore. The big problem is all the dealers sold into my other mobile home park, and it's not the same rules. Well, That's the big that. problem. So, so let me finish, all right? I asked if he'd seen the new zoning bylaw for trailer things, and which we're hopefully going to adopt, which would, I'm not sure if it would. No, but that's very much what's in this existing bylaw, Sarah. It's got green, it's got carport sheds, it's got, it's all exactly the same. But you're allowed two. In that one, you're only allowed one. What well, is an accessory building? Like, is a, it says in your existing bylaw, carport and a shed and a porch is not accessory, it's exempt. It says right in it, and we've done it with all our other projects until now. So a lawyer could interpret that the way Greg is interpreting. I worked in law for 20 years. I mean, I can't get a lawyer to draw. No, I had the lawyer if I can solve anything. No, I know. They I got a partner, Brian, so right that said today, just sell everything. And let's be Kate Sick. To the chair, yeah, no, this is why we, we started on this zoning bylaw when we first got in. It was the first one of the, the first things with the OCP we wanted to do is revamp our, our zoning bylaw because it, 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 like you say, it's it, it are it is archaic, it's uh, it's it's different. I don't know why, Gord, it's not, it's how you read it. Interpretation of the fire code, like Mark Lambert does all my storage, he says a carport doesn't create. A fire, it's not an enclosed space. Yeah. It's no different than a car sitting on a piece of pavement that catches on fire. It's a I agree with you. It's not a fire separation issue to the next mobile. Okay, so uh, I've, I, I look at a $5,000 for a code consultant report on every lot. It doesn't make any financial sense. So This is a council decision. You yeah. guys have to make a decision yeah. on your bylaw. It's not up to the developer to fight with Scott and Sarah. So, it's not up to me. Like, we shouldn't be doing it. We're putting my own on it already. This fire. It was. Okay, so I think that we should have a sit down make sure that that bylaw for that is reasonable for mobile home parks. And whatever we do there, the same as we're doing at the other lots over there from a six meter to a five meter, which honestly, you know, some of that fire regulation was based on those 20 year old units where you had to be six meters apart because if that one caught fire, that's 12 more gonna catch fire. But I think the way the new ones are built, they're more built like a house 
And yet in residential area, we allow five meters combined, two meters, three meters, add it up however you want. But minimum setback was two, five meters combined. So I don't know why we don't have that in this. Because if there, if it's all going to be new, like, but you're saying it might not be. No, well, I need to make financial decisions to move ahead. It's right. just business. Okay. It's just business. And, and, uh, so and 20 old units. They structures. They put, they're putting two homes in. They're drywall and hardy clay. They're no different than what Brian built. There's no difference. Or a little bit. <laughs> Go ahead, Scott. Well, no, I, I know I know what you're saying. I, hey guys, let's let's just let Scott have it. So I I'm willing to work with Greg and, and come up with some rules that meet the bylaw or determine, but I need I need to know what what Greg wants, what what his rules are, and then I can look at them and I and I haven't seen them yet. So I think probably that's some homework for Greg is to say, okay, this is what each lot can have. And this is the separation. Then we can compare them to the bylaw, we compare them to the new bylaw, and we can make sure we're all on the same page. But it, Greg's going to have to do some homework. And, you know, it was six families, then it was eight families, now it's 10. You better get, do your homework, Greg, because the time you get to your truck, there's only 12 families that haven't moved to the, the second place. Yeah, right? but I can take the easy road and just put in the old bylaw. Like, right? I don't, I, the market tells you what you want. I just supply dirt. So I'm telling them that we follow the rules. We give them our construction and design what we want to put on. So what rule? Because you can't you guys make a decision on our own? Like what's holding you back? So so you, you've applied for a building permit? Well, he, that's his job. But I don't know. Is it how is there a building you're permit? Going to put a building is there a building permit? permit? Has to apply for a building permit? I don't think so. I've talked to some previous owners, they don't have. They didn't apply for a building permit. So that, that's the way typically we do it. Someone applies for a building permit, shows us what they want to build, and we either issue the permit or give them advice on how to, on how to get there. We just see the design of our house that we want to pictures of it to you, our council. It's the fire separation. Dale says he can't do anything until you guys sign off. It's a chicken and egg thing, right? And it's just, it's all about, it's nothing to do with setbacks or nothing. It's code. What is the interpretation of the code and what is an accessory building? I'd, I'd, I'd recommend applying for a building permit and then whatever advice you're given through either the building inspector or staff, whether it's you know change your plan or apply for a variance, that's that's probably the best advice for you. I, I, I was told by my sales that I did not have to apply for a building permit. Because I don't own the land. I do. Well, Somebody I do. has to. So the building permit, and that's why I emailed your husband. Yeah. This, this is all getting dealt with, but it's a code issue. It's not, and it's interpretation of the code. Hey, hold it, Brian. You had something. Yeah, I just had a question, Greg. Um, your other, um, your other uh, project in another town that you're talking about. What town is that in? Did some stuff in the Nanaimo. Yeah. And it's and they and that um, they interpret the the code. Hey, my 15 units right here in Sycamus has carports. They were all issued permits by the district of Sycamus based on the present bylaws. I the problem is is countryside's got homes they sold in here three years ago, got all of these permits, and now they can't get them. Yeah, so I I tend to agree with the as far as a carport goes, um, but the pro I think the problem that happens is it starts out as a carport and then it goes from there, and that's 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 a lot of like I just know from experience in the past, um, you know the application is for a carport and it changes and, and there there's there's different ways around that, but I I, I agree I think that I think it would be a good idea to, to sit down with with the staff and the fire chief and get it sorted out, get a, get a plan, get a, a decision. Well, like I said, I drove out there and I, you're absolutely right. There's other ones out there, they have a carport attached to it. And, and then what happens is they start to close them in. Yeah. 
Because, because. Yeah, but if you have a rule but you can't close it in, yeah. then you have to follow that rule. Yeah. So as long as as long as whatever we do with that new zoning bond that you could have a carport and you could have an auxiliary building and that the setbacks are whatever. I, I think honestly that the setbacks, if they're new construction, shouldn't be any different than a house on a private lot. That that three and five is two two minimum, five maximum actually makes the lot more usable. Maybe it wouldn't interfere so much with that carport design. Um, but if it's not a property line, if it's not title. Yeah, it's not a tight. It's the, the imaginary line. Yeah. But we do follow the imaginary line. <laughs> and it's a separation of six meters. Where does that continue from? Like it's, it's mobiles, but now you want to exercise it. I know Brett does on every building. Like everything has to be six meters apart. And that's, you know, feedback Scott, Scott's getting from the fire chief, right? And, and quite frankly, I, you know, he's taking 1993 mobiles and tarnishing them with what's built today. It's not the same construction of your bylaw in 1993. I wouldn't have bought a 1993 construction today. I've lived in many houses, I've owned many houses in the province. But nobody in my existing park conforms to these bylaws. Yeah, this is a. Uh... This is, I mean, it's just so solvable. We just have to sit down and get it done. But the problem is, is these folks are ready to move in or they want to move in. Greg, have you applied for a building permit for these folks? We've had serious discussions, Scott and I. Yeah. It's, and that's why we're here today. And, you know, Jeff said, can you please come to town? And and, the, and it's, it's nothing to do with staff setbacks and everything. It's interpretation. So I don't know if staff can make that ruling or council can make that ruling. Staff should be able to make that ruling, but we we should tomorrow we should sit down with Brett and uh, Scott and Sarah and and uh, and you know our, if you want a planning committee and, and get this resolved. This this can't go on. I know it's been very stressful for us, very stressful, and then it's not just this stress. It's what's going on in the world too. And we made a major move. I mean, we moved here because my daughter lives here and. She loves it, and I mean, we want to contribute to. to okay, we, we we understand, and we just want to. Have, we 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 have uh, issues mostly because COVID drug out our planning development thing. We hopefully, it, it's like a lot of things. It, it's sometimes you catch that bylaw just a little bit too late. It's already been enacted. We, we are trying to work with the new zoning bylaw as opposed to the old one. That's why I asked for what it had in it. Now, it hasn't been, excuse me, it hasn't, it hasn't been adopted yet, so we have a chance to amend it, right? So if you leave us work with staff and Daryl to find out what it is that will make this thing fly, because we need the housing. And I personally don't want to see no 20-year-old trailers out there. Pardon me? I personally don't want to see 20-year-old trailers out there. I think you're lying. So if you give this committee a chance to meet, if we can arrange it tomorrow. So I, am I correct in understanding the bylaw that right now a carport shed is not considered an accessory building? Or is it? Depends how you interpret it. And that well, I know, like I worked in law, and I tell you, they can interpret a lot. I had this fight with Turner Valley many years ago, and I won. I got a lawyer involved because it's the interpretation of the law. You're saying now you're changing the bylaws right now, or but a building you permit by the old one. You, you haven't you haven't applied for a building permit. There's not a building permit thing. That oh. seems obvious to me. If you apply for a building permit, and then the district. Um, does an assessment of it and then gives you an answer, but that that doesn't it seems like that step is missing. It, it is missing here. This isn't the sort of house argument. I'll have a sit down with these guys. Okay, right. Go ahead, Scott. I I don't think the planning committee needs to to meet tomorrow. I think Greg needs to come up with some rules for his. I know what my rules park. are, Scott. I Greg needs to give me his rules for his mobile home park, saying what can happen on every lot, and I can look at them and provide him. A response back saying, yeah, you're right here, you're really right here, or you're wrong here, and you're really wrong there. Like, I need to see his rules so we know what's happening on each lot. And and each application we receive, we can look at his rules 
and make sure they're meeting his rules because we know they'll meet ours. Okay. How long will this process take? I, I, I'll do it tomorrow if Greg gets me his rules tomorrow. We want you in, in, your, in the community right away. I'm the team. I'm an asset. My daughter is an asset. I mean, and we'd like to see things happen here. I mean, I've even voted on the Red Barn already. <laughs> I'm a member. I mean, so there's things that we want to do, and yet we just can't get a definite answer on our own. Like, can we do this? Is it even going to happen? Or are things going to change overnight again? Are they that fluid that we just can't get settled? And, you know, I don't know, sometimes I'm picking up, like, there's tension between the developer here and here. I don't know if there's any personal stuff going on in politics. I don't care about that. There's nothing personal between Greg and me or the district. I like working with Greg. He's always smiling. That's why you're kind like, of like him. He's been around the block. Yeah. He's, built, he's built other homes. So the countryside has been in business a long time. So we live with that business background and People were really happy with it. It's, it's really this kind of problem. It's really not really an issue here on any scale. You know, yes. People would not even think of buying here if people didn't really know. I wouldn't have bought when, here if I had on this. And you guys would really know this in a different way. I'm serious. And it's sad that this is happening. The second this is a nice area. I mean, the whole area is cool. So I, I just don't understand how. <clears throat> Long because like, wait, seven, we should have known seconds. this last year. This I, was on, I was on the case of this last year, last July, after we bought and put money down. Nothing has happened. As a matter of fact, it's worse. When I heard you guys say it's worse, there's nothing that's made, nothing concrete. We want to buy it. I just don't understand the business. The town, the developer. I go the developer. I kind of be scared. I do have some relatives that are developers. I'd be scared to have them come here and do something about <coughs> seeing what's happening here. But I don't want this to be a bad taste. I want it to be all right. Move on. Cause, I mean, I've dealt with garbage in my life working in a hospital. I, December of 2020, I worked through COVID. Trust me, I've dealt with garbage. So, so this committee was formed so we could come in and we could find out what was going on. Now, yeah. now, now we got an idea, and now Greg Carroll has to come back with what he wants to see on there. Because without a development permit, you can't even ask for a variance. So you make the application. And this committee may or may not recommend it, but it's not even our decision. It has to go to council. The council, the six members of the mayor make the decision on what will happen on that development. Last week, we came in and a guy was asking for 25 different variances. We gave him one and said, blanket the whole property with it and have a nice day. You make the rest of it work. So when Greg comes back with what he's asking for, Scott will review. It may come back to this committee again, and but it is ultimately council's decision as to what will happen. So I'd like to thank you for coming in and thank you for your time. Go ahead. And Jeff, that's that's for a variance. That's that's not for a building permit. If everything fit in our bylaws, you could understand them. I mean, these bylaws are dated 1993. Uh, to be fair to the staff, they they didn't adopt these. These were adopted back in 1993. They are, they are archaic. They're hard to understand. So our goal was when we became elected is to change our planning department, get it up and running, and, and make some new bylaws, which take time. And of course, we run into COVID and it's stretched even longer. And yeah, we recognize there is a problem in our development. Uh, there was a problem in our development department for sure. But Scott and Sarah and, and Steph, Steph they, they didn't they didn't make these bylaws. These are these are these were made by previous uh, staff and, and we have to change them. Because in my understanding of law, because we bought when the old bylaws are still in the back, the new ones have to come. Development should be passed according to the old bylaws because you haven't come up with new ones yet. They have been passed. 
Yeah, they haven't been passed, but these no, ones here are hard. This doesn't apply. I have a date of purchase, so I have a date that I gave money for the lot. So we we understand that. Okay. You know, you purchased the lot. You know, you got to build it already that you want to put on it. The issue is to set that. So I'm going to ask that Scott or the planning department actually pull up what was done on those 17 existing. Are you talking about with Strata? Sorry, through the chair. Strata. So I have looked at those a couple times. There's a lot of accessory structures that have gone up without building permits. And we won't know about them until somebody, unless somebody complains. So we can't really speak to what has happened previously as a comparison of how the bylaw was applied. But are there carports? There are carports. Oh, there's a whole mishmash of stuff going on out there. And, and are any of them permitted? Some of them are, a lot of them aren't. I'd have to look again. It's been about a year since the last time I looked at it. We want to put fire because we know fires happen here. So we want fire. And I was hoping that my neighbor would have that too. You know, like, so that was what we were thought everything would be the same. Yeah, we, we, we have a lot of experience with fire. <laughs> Make one last year. So, so thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot. Welcome to town. Thank you. <laughs> so, Greg, are you going to be able to put together what your idea, your bylaws are going to be on that property? Like, you're going to have to have some rules, right? Well, that's the rules that are in. It's interpretation of the rules. That's all it is. Rules and rules, you have to follow the rules. Our cutboards exempt are the accessory bill, torches, decks. There's only, if, if it's determined there's only one accessory, and they are accessories, decks, sheds, and carports, you can only have one. If they're not considered, if, if they're not considered accessory, then you can have all three. And the curb bylaw states that they're that's true or not. So looking at the, the development, you can see the outlines of the units that have received building permits. That we've received this drawing and it shows where they are. And the ones that received, like probably there's probably eight building permits that have been issued. So those ones we know met, met all the rules, everybody's interpretation of the rules. What I need from Greg is the rules that he wants to see for carports and accessory buildings and garages on this development, what he's going to tell each person as they're purchasing their unit, this is what you can do. These are the setbacks that you are required to, to, to adhere to. So then I can look at his rules and compare them to our bylaw to make sure that he's getting the same information that we're getting. But Scott, we're going around in a circle. We need Brett to have sir. I was right there with Brent. He does. He wants six meters from the edge of a carport to the next mobile. That's right. Not from mobile to mobile. That's the issue. It's not you or Sarah. I need. I it's need. The fire Greg, I need you to put this down on paper and it's give it to me. Right. Like I just need an answer. The answer. Get it. Oh, right now. I'll tell you no today. Put it down. Show it to me, and maybe I'll tell you yes. But you need to put it down on paper. Can I? Like, okay, as an owner of a couple of mobile home parks, um, what I put in my rules is it's subject to the local regulations. So I understand what Greg's saying. It's that if, you know, is it six meters to the imaginary line or is it six meters to the next mobile? If it's six meters to the next mobile, like that, you know, like I guess what I would say, Greg, is, is write that down and give it to Scott. I, I, I think we are kind of going in circles here. I'm not. Go ahead. I think we need to call Brett and get him in the office tomorrow and sit him down and say, what's your, explain. He refers his comments to, to the process. Mm -hmm. Right? That's how it works with council. Fire chief, engineers, everybody refers their comments back to the staff. I call staff Sarah and Scott, right? They're only, I'm not defending them or, or saying they're wrong. That's the process, and your guys' process is broken in today's current codes. Yeah. So when, when I get Greg's rules, I will sit down with Dale and Brett. Dale, Brett, and Greg, and I will sit 
stood out there at the back of Greg's truck and we came up with a whole bunch of different scenarios and we agreed on some things, disagreed on some others. I need Greg to put it down for me on a piece of paper so I can take it to Brett, I can take it to Dale and I can say, guys, this is, this is his rules. Are they gonna work? Or are they not? What changes need to occur here to make these work? Or what is just it going to be impossible to, to make work? That's what we need to do. Um, <clears throat> could I ask? I'd like to have an like, ID to this. Instead of yeah, this you can. I'd like to have a student name myself. That would be nice. They'll have to push it next week, one way or the other. So, can we uh, actually consider that if they're Construction that they're built the other lot, five meter total minimum. If, if we had 24 building permits, and we can assess all 24 building permits at the same time and issue them one after another. That would that'd be ideal. I don't think I'm going to get 24 building permits. So I need I need some parameters for, for which I can accept a building permit. Okay. So go ahead, sir. Just in response to your comment about the two and five, um, this current, the new zone is contemplating a 1.2 meter and a five meter. So a 1.2 is to their, their yard line, the line for their yard, and the five is from other adjacent buildings and structures. So whatever it is, right? So if it's just a mobile home or if it has, you know, a covered porch on it, it's five from there to the next building. So I think part of the issue is that as each lot sells and folks choose their siting, it's kind of all over the map. You see the lot eight, the really skinny one. You can see how it's become squished because it was one of the, it was sold after the other two. So if you look at older mobile home parks, really old ones, they're all shuffled to one side of their yard, consistently the same all the way along. Mm -hmm. But that's when they were single wides and they're all built the same way. The door is only on one side. You have no choice but to put it on. Do you know what I mean? So I'm seeing some like bigger setbacks and things getting pushed into the center. But they're small lots, right? So in terms of maximizing outdoor space, you kind of want them off to one side. Can I just say something to that? Thank you for that because... This is what happened with us from home provider last fall. We purposely set ours to the one side, the 1.5, oh, as tight as we could to allow for this. Uh, the other side of our unit to have the what we needed for a space. Okay? We were told, yes, everybody should be doing the same thing. So we started in that, we were the first ones who picked that lot. Oh, as you can see, uh, well, there's nothing beside us right now. But the other ones, which is what I was informing Jeff of this week, they're set right in the middle. They're not going to be able to do much. No uniformity. Well, the dot in line is just the setback parameters, yeah. right? But, of where the whole has to sit. But then there is a separation, then that's what Scott wants on everybody. And that's fine. That, what did he request? It's not 100% okay. We have, you know, because you might get a double wide, then a single wide, and a single wide, and a double wide. The market picks what they want. I don't I don't pick. It's not like the olden days in 93, where you only had two models that were going to choose from. Yeah. Period. Now they're everywhere from 28 feet wide to 76 feet long to Manufactured homes, you know. So, I guess I'll ask the question if that dotted line inside the lot line is, is, beats all this, all the criteria, then your unit could go a little further to the towards the other lot line and, and, you would meet all the stuff if your carport entered where the uh, yeah. light is. So how this is a confusion, right? So take this home here, right? Yeah. This home has to be six meters, so it can be on this dotted line because this is six point four three, right? But if you put a carport here and you have to measure six meters, this home can't go on that dotted line. 
that's the issue. They want to put a carport here. Yeah. Now this home has to go to here because it's six meters from the edge of the carport. That's the issue. There's no issue with placement of homes. It's the accessory bill. That's all it is. Yeah. Right? So if it was an open air freestanding yeah. in your zoning thing and never could be closed in, never. Well, I can only put a permit in which is requested. You, I can't tell you 20 years from now, some guy goes to Home Depot and gets a bunch of two by fours and frames it in. Like, you don't need a building permit for a, a shed under 100 square feet. They can build a 10 by 10, put it in their corner. Well, under, I can't police that in other places in District of Sycamus, right? When a guy builds a shed. That's why so it's your part. Can stop with <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, then if you put together what you would like to see on the lots, I, I, I've i seen some of those fabricated carports. I mean, they're a steel post, four corners, steel frame. I don't, usually they got a tin roof on it too, don't they? You can't, there's no discrepancy. We, we were going to do all this with, we were told, uh, all aluminum and steel structure. My contractor, I just found out that because of the snow load here in this area, in 100, you have to have every eight to 10 feet a post down the center of the beam. Well, how are you going to drive in that to support this little well? So here, I couldn't do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is a place for that. Let me discuss that because I build 50 foot span buildings okay. with no posts. Yeah, so yeah, that's, 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 an in, that's an engineering thing. Possibly the, the manufacturer that you were talking about, that particular unit wouldn't have the snow load capacity, but there's no, that's not a thing. You can, you can build that. That's it's just engineer. Go ahead, just one thing, and back to Scott's comments about uh, Greg's rules and that too. As a mobile home park owner, you can say, yeah, you, I, as far as the policing, you got to figure that out, but you can say that you are allowed a carport, but you are not allowed to enclose it. Boom. And if you put, put that in the rules, you put that in your park rules, you can do that. And then, you know, like, like I say, how it gets policed down the road, you know, who knows, but you can actually put that in your park rules as part of incorporating into what Scott's coming up with regarding the bylaws. I don't think the filling in the carport. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. You can do that in your lease agreements. That's not the issue. The issue is the six meter separation from the fire chief. That's the issue. I, I understand that, but if you can close some of these loopholes, it, it, it'll help your case is all I'm saying. So like lot four, right now we have a building that's put them all in there. You don't know what they're building. We actually have, in every lot we're starting the next 16, this thing will probably, 35 homes will be in there by September. New homes, if I can sort this out. That's good to sort it out. So uh, just because I spent my entire life in the steel building, Steel doesn't burn. Like if you put in a four post steel, which you're going to have to meet the, the load, if you put a steel truss across both ends, and whatever you put on for a roof, as long as it supports the load, then where's the fire issue? Like it, it can't catch fire. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to, to give a little um, sort of background. This one here <clears throat> went in in 2010. Has a carport. It was a show home. It's been there for 13 years. 12 years. Right? Yeah, the zoning allows a carport. And it's a aluminum one. It's a solo. Has a shed too. It's got a shed. So in terms of it, it would be helpful to speak with the fire chief. So in terms of the comments that he gives us who are planning referrals, they're pretty consistent. His concern is access for firefighting, right? So the BC Building Code addresses proximity between, so something steel is probably going to satisfy the building code, right? Fire Chief, his comments are all about being able to get into a tight site, right? An intensively developed site 
to be able to fight fire. That's all, right? And, and it's up to council as to whether or not they consider it or not, right? So there, it's always passed on to council. It's always considered, right? So put together your rules, present them to Scott. We'd like to do a blanket on the whole thing. Yeah, well, that's what have bylaws. It's interpretation of the. Your bylaws are here. They're all easy to follow. It's the interpretation of with the fire separation. Can I write something? <laughs> I just, I just want to move on. I'm sorry, but um, you know, like we've got to start somewhere. Let's let's get it done. Amen. Put what you want. He'll reply. I'm sorry, I kind of lost it there for a second. So your carport will be within the dotted line? Yes. Has to be. Has to be. Yeah, that's the, the area to approve, right? Has to be within the dotted line. And so are those two dotted lines six meters apart? No. No, no they don't have to. They're three meters. 1.2, I, I think we sit down with Brett tomorrow. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with Scott. I'm sorry about that, Scott. Uh, we, he's, yeah, I think we need to sit down with him tomorrow and, 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 uh, and Greg be there and, and Scott and Sarah and, and uh, get this done. This is, uh, this is crazy. Well, I mean, if you read this, I interpret it, you can go ahead and do it. I'm not, it's how you interpret it. Let's get it done. <laughs> you, have, you have to give them some paperwork to start with, Greg. Yeah, no, we can, I can play with that. Yeah. Good day. That's the starting, that, that permit is the starting point that actually makes it that there has to be a decision made, so. Oh, that's fair enough, that's fair enough. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a we have a two more items on there. What were your other thing? I want to deal with uh, well, we got water meters, which is a big issue, um, and then my other mystery of the balance of land. Like is that residential or is that industrial? It's it's residential. It was, it was rezoned. The council adopted the bylaw to rezone. So how come Melinda told me it wasn't? I, and I got her email. I can't explain it. Mm -hmm. I can't explain it. The council made passed the resolution to rezone that property. Final reading. So why is BC reading. assessment still got it at it's on your website as industrial yeah. and BC assessment has it as industrial? Can't, can't explain it. When did we do that? I can't, I can't remember. I'd have to, was it 2019? I think 2019. it was. Yeah. And it's just said, asked here, but you let me know if you want Stop to. Yet, I emailed her. Jamie Franklin said he'll fill out an affidavit. I said, no, don't go ahead with it. We thought everything was okay. Could you get a development permit on this one again after Melinda? But I've got a deal I've committed to. Another huge developer coming to town here, and I committed on what I could do on that. I've got dry and tell better stores. And Dean Bouvet is a very good friend of mine. And I and I gotta tell him tonight he's in Hawaii. If it's a no go, he needs to know. So why did it get rezoned to residential? Or why did you ask to rezone it to residential? You were gonna do a bigger park? We're gonna do a bigger mobile home park. And I said to Melinda, I need the flexibility for long term storage for hide and everything. But Old Town Bay needs a ton of storage if they go ahead. I just need to know if it's gone, if it's too late. I just wash my hands and tell these guys. So, what's it take to rezone, Scott? How long does it take? We'll say a you know, month and a half, two. Counts like, you know, three council meetings, you know, a month between the first two, and then however long it takes Ministry of Transportation, which you might not need approval on this one, 
Um, so, you know, two months, two to three months, six to eight weeks. I've got the email to Melinda. I sent you a copy. Yeah. Same with Fry. The council adopted the bylaw, though. So, well, you weren't here, Scott. No. But <laughs> so, and then it's not even changed on your website. I got the other developers that have looked at the, the website. So somehow it's changed, and I don't know. So Melinda must have brought up the council for us to vote on. It had to have been. We don't just, it just doesn't fall out of the air. So we're not sure how it ended up. But, but if we voted on it, then we went through the process to change it. I, I do remember changing it. 100% you did it. The drawings were done. I sat, I sat here and talked. And then I had some good conversations about what the future needs were, you know, because we, Brian was, you know, getting rid of Rick and all of that kind of stuff. Part of the whole plan is that's why we're doing the rack storage. I got High Mountain. I got good friends looking at Old Town Bay. Where does all this stuff go? We have a very successful model of what is the toys. Can I make a recommendation? Sure. Thane's not going to start building and uh, or needing those in the next three or four months. Oh, but if that if they pull the pin and Scott confirmed that it, if he has all the stock, they can get a DP and then Epic can do all the marketing. But I can't have him say Boys and Toys is involved if I don't have the land. As soon as the cul de sac goes in, yep. you know, that's with Jeremy and Group right now, and that's Sarah's DP, which Sarah's handled everything. Those storage units I got 30, all that deposits. I have no more land to build strata storage. And the market's huge. And now you're finally turning the corner at Sycamus. All these guys that buy a multifamily waterfront, they can afford 150 grand for a storage unit. Because there's no place to put the trailers. Let's get it rezoned and keep it going. I shouldn't have to come back and pay money but the whole process, but I did the right thing. I mean, Greg, if you could provide that letter, I'm sure we could get a re resolution from council to waive the fees. That's what Melinda said, for sure. Well, Scott Hansen, what did Melinda say? I, I didn't read anything that said Melinda said, hey, this zoning didn't go through. I have a resolution from council saying, yeah. well, you saw the email I wrote Melinda. I saw an email you wrote Melinda, but she doesn't say anything in her response. Okay. Complicated. Huh? Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Short term rentals. Who's got that one? Hey. Sarah. Sarah. Hey. So context, did the committee ask for an update on short-term rentals? I didn't hear what you said, so. Was, you guys were asking, sorry? Yes, please. The committee asked for an update. Yes. Okay. I was just asked to throw these up there, so here they are. Okay, so um, we've got our, our timeline, current timeline, where we're at, so 2021, 2022. So February, March, um, so this past month, Last week, maybe the week before, um, the corporate officer and I met with a representative from Airbnb to have a talk with them about short-term rentals and the upcoming regulations in Sycamus. Um, so from there, we're currently working on a strategy of outreach. So one of the ideas was that if we could connect with Airbnb, we could connect with anybody using their platform to try to make that contact. Um, aside from that, we're working on a mail out based on our tax rule and just who owns second home, second homes. Like it's not their principal place of residence. It may or may not be being used as an Airbnb, but it's just the best way to help identify, right? Um, so we will be preparing a website for information that will go along with the mail out uh, that will refer people to the website for more information. Um, and then we're hoping that in April, um, we could potentially be doing first reading of bylaw amendments 
that go alongside the zoning bylaw. So the zoning bylaw is still where it's at with MOTI, um, but we could bring forward um, the new fees and we could bring forward the new business license requirements that would go along with that. Um, because there are a number of, of properties, mostly the condos, that already have existing zoning that would allow them to get a business license. So what we understand from council is that there's a desire for enforcement. So we could start with that. Um, just some gentle overtures. Hey, we understand that you, you may be running a, a short-term rental, a business license is required, like it's always been required. And uh, here's the process to apply. So that would be sort of a starting point. Um, so Stephanie, if you want to just move through the slides. So this information has been presented before back in November. These, these are the zoning bylaw components of the short-term rental regulations. So there's a few zones where they'll be allowed. Um, and there's in our residential zones um, for accessory dwellings, we would just fold it in with a bed and breakfast and there wouldn't be any pen penalties for doing something like that. Something like that would just fall under a standard business license. There would be no changes to taxes or utilities or anything like that. Yeah, it would just be as it is. Um, and then aside from that, so anyone that is wanting to use a principal dwelling unit on a property in a residential area would need to ask for a bylaw amendment to permit short-term rental as a use on that parcel. So that's more of the big one. So it's just a way of getting them into council. Exactly. So that's part of what the mail out is for is to like make sure that they're getting this information so they know because we're going to need, we're going to be asked to start enforcing on these properties at some point, right? Um, there seems to be a really strong desire for that. Uh, next slide, please. These are the general regulations. So these speak to things like parking regulations. Um, we've added in there since the last time we brought this forward for feedback, a maximum occupancy. Um, it's in red. So of course, all of this can be changed as needed. Um, so two adults per sleeping unit, just looking at adults who bring vehicles, right? As opposed to kids. So kids would be a little different. Um, the, a change potentially here since talking with our chief financial officer is that we might not be looking at these a different metering system. From what I understand, we already have something in place around utilities and billings um, that we don't really need to play with. And the other thing is that money that would go into those funds, we wouldn't be able to divert it to say by law enforcement, which would need to be ramped up if we're gonna start enforcing. So it's not really, the best tool perhaps for disincentivizing short-term rentals in residential areas. So it's in highlight right now, this, this particular regulation could be pulled out of there because it doesn't really make sense with the current way we charge utility fees. Uh, next slide. So this is the parking regulation for short-term rental. This was not in the last presentation. So this is what's in there is one space per bedroom available would need to be provided. Um, we've had a look at some of the guidance materials provided by Kelowna, for example, um, and they've got some really helpful diagrams around that showing people, you know, what would be acceptable for parking provisions. So as opposed to filling in your whole ditch along your front yard and parking all across the front, that's an issue, right? Um, so we've provided some drawings about stacking parking, that kind of thing, for example. So these are some things we could build in as support material. Next slide, please. This would be, here's sort of a rough out of um, the kind of changes that would be made to the fees and charges bylaw. Um, so licensing fees, looking at, and this is kind of based, this is based on some feedback from when it was uh, workshop with council by Melinda with some tweaks because we sort of changed the approach a bit with better breakfasts, for example. Um, so strata units in a mixed use building. So there we do have zoning that allows both multifamily and hotel. So we do have buildings where some units people live in and some units are being used like a hotel unit, a sh like a short term rental. Um, so it would be $300 a year is, is the suggestion. Um, so that's the double from 150 that was originally proposed. Um, for a strata or RV site, so say like in Silver Sands, where they're being used that way, it would just be a standard business license fee, $95. That's our base fee currently. 
So not really any change. So someone could get a business license right now in any of those RV parks because it's a strata resort and they could, that would be the fee and that won't, wouldn't change. To do a short-term rental in a home, principal home, 1700 a year, and that's double from the, the last proposal as was workshop with council. I think it was 850 originally was the suggestion. And then we've popped in there for if it's an owner occupied. So somebody lives there all year round. And then when they go on vacation in the summer, they go on a houseboat or they go out to their site, right? If they're not impacting housing, so there's a suggestion of a lower rate, 300 a year in that case, because they live there most of the time and it's only in the summer that they're doing the whole house. So of course, you know, the, the responsible person requirement would still apply. You know, somebody needs to be available to respond if people are disturbing the neighborhood. Um, so that would still apply. And then for a bed and breakfast, same just normal rate for business license, $95 a year. So not trying to penalize that, trying to support a home-based business basically. So that would be the same fee you'd be charged for any other home-based business. Um, so inspection fees, we have an existing inspection fee of $150. It's just a special inspection fee. So we could use that for the inspection. So the one of the requirements of getting a business license would be that you have to have an inspection by the building inspector and or the fire chief. And so that might be at the discretion of the building inspectors, whether or not the chief needs to come in. I'm not sure what the context would be. Utility fees, the recommendation has been not to touch them, so no change. And we've had conversation about that before. Next slide, Steffi. Can we just stick with that one for a minute? Yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing I was gonna say is we gotta quit using Airbnb. Yeah. Can we back that up, please? Because Airbnb is is a company. It's not, it doesn't mean like there's VRBO, there's, yeah. you know, there's all that you see. We shouldn't use Airbnb. It suggests we're limiting this to Airbnb short-term rentals. And I don't think that's the case, right? Yeah. No. So are you meaning like the term, the use of the term? So the term itself isn't built into any of the bylaws. Okay. I just saw it on, on a slide. So I, you know, I think we should avoid Airbnb meeting or whatever. I think we should just, you know, avoid using the term and, and, and also make people understand that, yeah, all platforms are being yeah. addressed. So Short-term short rental is the... Mm. Short-term rental is a, a term that we can use loosely in place of saying Airbnb. It's like saying Kleenex. You, you just mean a tissue, right? Um, in our bylaw, it's it's been defined as a very specific, narrowed space. And then we're using other terms in places where it's already permitted, if that makes sense, rather than calling it a short-term rental. Can we go back to your fees page, please? I, I thought we were talking a lot more seriously about those fees. This, this is not even a deterrent. When you rent your place, those you're talking strata, so you're talking about stuff on the water that is in condominiums. They rent them for thirty five hundred a week. Right. Well, and that's and that's up to deterrent here. Yeah, and this is up to feedback, right? So the last feedback was the double what was originally proposed. So this is what they look like doubled. Yeah, well, it's absolutely open to feedback and, and the, counsel. The, the short term rental where it's owner occupied, I agree with that $300 because he's going to be there, he's going to save us some money. But I thought we were trying to go that, you know, if you're doing short term rental and you're making money out of it, you're a business, you're interfering against the hotel. So we're going to try and go with if your place is worth thousand dollars in property tax if you were a hotel how much would your place be worth so if your appraisal on your place was five hundred thousand dollars what would the commercial tax rate be compared to that residential tax rate and that was where we were trying to go to make it an even playing field with the hotels when we created the mrdp tax that's exactly what we told them we were going to do Level the playing field. Yeah, so that's a separate piece, right? So we've got a bunch of several different tools to disincentivize it. And these are part of it. And absolutely, we can change these. These are just suggested, right? But the MRDT tax would also apply. I mean, for that assessment piece, so what I can say after talking to BC Assessment is some short term rentals are already assessed as business class or paying that. Some are not. Yeah. It depends. And they don't really, because it 
it's fluid and it moves. So to come up with something um, that says you're going to pay the same amount, it, it fluctuates. So we can't really use that piece. We can just set up our own fees that make sense for what we do that help us cover the cost and at least make them have inspections, have business licenses, um, collect the tax that then goes back into the community. Well, but that's what I was saying is, is that I thought that our fee schedule is going to be your property is worth $500,000 and you're paying $1,000 or $2,000 a year now in property tax. That's what's based as a residential. As a commercial building, it would be three times that. It would be double. Double? Correct. Okay. Just under double. Just under double. That is, that is where we need to get to. Right. So then you're talking about a scale. So you're you're considering the value of the property and basing your fee on that because that's they, very inconvenient. They, they come in to apply for the permit. They give you an address. You got a BC assessment that says it's worth X amount of dollars. Now, they're not going to remit the, the, the BC assessment or to the income tax rule. So their license fee would be that doubling price if it's double. So if they're paying $1,000 in property tax, they're going to pay $1,000 for their license fee here. That makes the playing field level. And it might be somewhat of a deterrent. Our hotels, their business licenses that way, based on what I see in our current bylaw, hotel would pay $95 a year. No, but they're already paying the higher rate commercial. They're already paying business tax. They're already paying the property tax basis on that. They're not paying residential rate. They're paying whatever the right. tax. So, so you know what becomes complicated in this, and I hear what you're saying loud and clear, is that there's a lot of um, um, Airbnbs, for example, that maybe only do it for two months of the year, but then have a long-term renter for the next. Or, for example, the short-term renter only occupied. They they are only using it for that activity for a short period, and then they're using it as a residential use. So then do you prorate that commercial piece or you just classify it for the whole year it's commercial? It becomes a little bit more complicated and not so easy because there's so many different scenarios from a fee structure. It's easier to pick a number and say that's what it is, so, whatever the number is. So we have an issue with people that come to this community that they got to move out in May and they can move back on the 6th of September. So that these people can make a wagon full of money in the two month window. <coughs> so I don't care. You just double their tax. That's their fee. Because I could name you six people right now that are looking for a place to live. They can't find a place to live and they have to move out. And our CAO is one of them. Like it's retarded. So when you come to this community and you want to get a job and you want to work here, you want to live here, you don't want to move into a tent for two months of the year so that somebody can fill their back pocket because they can't afford the mortgage or whatever the reason is that they're doing it for. So that's why we don't have any housing. If half of these places that were being rented out as short-term rental, just for that two months in the window, so you go to, you go to uh, Revelstoke, their time frame is reverse of ours. You can rent there all summer long all year, except for now it's ski season. Now they want the short-term rental. So, so if, if you want to build a community, you want long-term permanent residency, it shouldn't be up to us to build 220 houses to fill that boot while we still allow people to have 10 months occupancy. The hotels do the same thing. They make most of their business in certain times of the year. They're not full all the time, yet we don't give them a break on the tax. Right. So if you want to have an Airbnb, you have to look at their assessment and you have to say, your property taxes are this, your license fee is going to be that same amount. So you basically double. Somehow you have to deter the short-term rental. Go ahead, Gord. I, I agree where you're coming from, Jeff, on, on, on that point. We got to change it, but I don't know how you can change it for the tax reason, for the tax reason of the value of the property. 
it's really tough to do. I know our, our rate is, uh, uh, my Kelowna rate is 7, 785 for year round. I mean, ours is 1700. Um, some other communities are a little bit more, not, not a lot more than like, uh, like 2000, but I think maybe if Sarah, because I, I guess we got to wrap it up, but if Sarah, you can send that to us and we could digest that one more time. And, uh, yeah, no, and we got to watch out too, because a lot of the, if you look at the percentage we get in revenue uh, on our, uh, on our, uh, short-term rentals or our, our, uh, what do you call it? MRDT. MRDT. <laughs> um, we get a, we get a ton of dough from short-term rentals. You still get it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you're not. I mean, we do get a, get a fair amount. Of, what's the percentage? I, we talked about it. You know, the reporting we get from MRDT changes every month. So sometimes they have the online platform piece. Sometimes they don't. It's super inconsistent. But our issue still in this community is housing. Yeah. For local mm -hmm. year round housing. Yeah. Not so, 10 months of the year housing. So part of what I'm looking at is we've had there's some new data that's come available and I need to I'm comparing different data sets. So it's taking a little time to get access to these different data sets. So part of what we're doing for the mail out is identifying all these second homeowners to contact them. And so we've got about 126 in single family residential zones. So I mean, if we focus on that, because a lot of the multifamily, they, their zoning already allows this, right? To try to go back on that now is right? Um, but in the residential areas, it's a different story. So, I mean, we can start there um, and go from there and see what kind of impact that has on our housing situation. It's, it's I, I, I just, I apologize, but the, the whole deal, when I went and talked to some of the hotels and got Cynthia to sign up, the, the whole deal was, they were all on the same page. They wanted a level playing field for the people that were their competition. We have to get there. And the, the, the you know, want to have Airbnb. As long as you're paying the property taxes, they're paying. That's the deterrent. Not that they can deal on 100 pieces of property to say that your business license, your property taxes are $1,000, you're going to pay $1,000 for your business license. That's not that hard to do. You know, Jeff, when Kelly and I went around, and I think maybe Colleen was there too. Yes, she was. We were talking to Cynthia and, 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 and the Best Western and all, the whole group individually. They all wanted a level playing field. And, you know, they, they pay commercial insurance. The, most of these people will pay residential insurance. You know, they, they pay commercial taxes. Most of these people pay residential taxes. So they, they, they were really upset and they didn't want to sign the MRDT. So we, you know, so we, we said we'd do our best and try to try to get it uh, to, to tax them differently through the government. It would be hard to do. About um, and, and something that, you said that. Could, could be a requirement is like proof of like a different type of insurance that allow short-term rentals, which is more expensive. Like I noticed on City of Kelowna, if you look at City of Kelowna, Nelson, City of Penticton, they've got some really good um, one pagers of the requirements that they have. Um, and one of them is like, you have to show like to the city, you have to have your business license on your platform, whatever that is. So there's, there's, there's like, Four or five things that can be done that make it so it's even yeah. or more even, not exactly. That's all I care about. But more, yes. So that is a requirement of you have to have proper insurance to cover your short-term rentals, and that we can embed in our our rules. Yeah, I just I'm just saying it's got to get level. And I think, and I think some of the stipulations about having or not the person that uh, that's that has to has to be there that that may swing and deter people is like people just want to have the house and live somewhere else just have have airbnb money's coming in kind of things um so that part of it that you know i think the deterrent is the big, is the big thing. Right. right well thank you very much staff uh, <laughs> I was wondering whether we, we, we cannot afford to lose. We just need to get fixed. Yeah. You notice he wasn't wearing his pink shirt, did you? Yeah.
Well, he wasn't being a bull either. He, he just anyway, the, are we oh, deferring the rest? Of, my apologies. I, I had one last thing to share. I don't need to go into great detail. Just wanted to start letting everybody know we have a new mapping system. Do you remember Lightship? We'll have a look at our new one. Play with it. Let me know if you have any questions or issues. Contact me. I'm your girl. Um, but this is our new map. Great. So is it's it live on a parcel? It is live. It's linked into the website. So if you go to our top thing, maps, it takes you right here. Um, and we have a bunch of really cool new tools. Too bad. Thank you. How long has it been sitting there now? <laughs> I know. I've been, I didn't want to eat. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. I'm getting in trouble. I, well, you always wonder what that is. Yeah. Oh. Acting your lips away. Yeah.